Go. Um, and for everybody att in attendance right now, I've gone ahead and started the recording. Hi, Matt. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. We have our applicants and everybody else involved is here. I've gone ahead and started recording. Um, so whenever you're ready. Great. Well, let's go ahead and get uh, get started. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us uh, this evening for this Salt Lake City uh, appeals um, hearing. This, we, uh, the sole matter on our agenda is PLNAPP 2023-00109, appeal by Tanner Cleggett uh, regarding uh, property at 107 North F Street. And it's the appeal regarding an appeal of an administrative decision. Uh, and so, um, with with everyone here, uh, let me just have uh, city staff, if they'd like to jump in and just give any introductory remarks, and then we'll turn some time over to the applicant or their uh, uh, representative. Thank you, Mr. Worthlin. I'm Catherine Pasker, Senior City Attorney here on behalf of Salt Lake City. Um, as you noted, this is an appeal of admi an administrative decision by the zoning administrator to revoke a zoning certificate and issue a notice and order related to associated zoning code violations. As outlined in the city's brief that was submitted in this matter, the standard of review is de novo and the appellant has the burden of proof in showing that the zoning administrator's decision to revoke the zoning certificate and issue the notice and order identifying the zoning code violations was incorrect. Um, I'll reserve the balance of my comments um, for the city's response, which according to the policies and procedures is to be made after the appellants. Yes, correct. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so who, who is here representing the uh, the applicant, the appellant? I am Todd, Todd Wheeler. Thanks, Todd. Um, I'll turn the time over to you uh, for um, uh, for you to uh, kind of make your case, so to speak. Thank you. Uh, Tanner Cleggett and I work at the same law firm, Christensen and Jensen here in Salt Lake, and um, this uh, brief was due during the legislative session, so I had him do it because I was otherwise preoccupied. Um, can I assume that all of you have seen our response and are familiar with the 15 exhibits, or should I walk through that? You're you're welcome to walk walk through it. I mean, that's part of the record and will be yeah. considered in that decision. So what, what, mm. what, whatever you'd like to do. Okay, um, thank you. So um, I represent Weishan Jen. He's been the owner of this property at 107 North F Street um, since the early 1990s. And, um, um, and and I know, and and I've seen some of the media reports, I know that, you know, that there have been some 
neighbor complaints that date back, I think, um, decades. And I, I just want to start off by saying, you know, if um, if we lose this appeal and go back to, uh, I guess, a definition um, in the 70s, I'm, I'm not sure that the neighbors are going to be any more happy than they are now. Um, um, and uh, I, I understand, you know, I've been on a city council myself, I was on the Woods Cross City Council um, from 1999 to 2003, and I used to cover the Planning Commission when I was on that city council. And I've been in the state legislature uh, for 12 years, so I, I understand it's impossible to keep everybody happy uh, all the time. Um, but as I as I, as we researched this, um, I, I I was um, somewhat um, perplexed that you know that some of these issues have come up before, and um, you know uh, Exhibit Number 12, for instance, um, I thought was uh, particularly compelling because back in um, I believe it was uh, 2009. Well, maybe that was just the date this was printed. No, it was a, a back in the 1990s, uh, Exhibit 12. It, it basically says this case has come up before and has had a lengthy history because the only definition for rooming house um, prior to 1995 is out of the business license chapter and it allows occupancy by the day. It's been determined that, the, that there is a non-conforming use and the daily stay will be permitted. This property has been licensed as a rooming house since 1979, was advised by Lynn Pace, the city attorney, there's nothing legally to stand on because of the unclear definition, which for boarding or rooming houses, there's a big conflict with the current definition of rooming house closed case. And so it appears to me that this exact same issue, I'm, I'm dealing with um, issue number one, not the parking spaces, that this exact same issue was raised in the 90s um, and the decision was made that this was a non-conforming use and, and that the definition of rooming house was ambiguous. And, and, then, and then fast forward, you know, 25 years or so, and, and, and we're back here having a similar conversation. And I recognize um, that probably none of you were in your current positions in the 90s. Um, I get that. And, and this is a de novo review, so I'm not saying that, that you're... Um, Bound by this. this. By the way, the date that Exhibit 12 says that the status was resolved was uh, October 2nd of 1998. So that would be just shy of 20, 25 years ago. I'm just saying that th these issues have been persistent for a while. And yet every year, uh, including this year, uh, Mr. Jen has been allowed to renew his business license and has been paying you know th those fees to the city. And so, um, uh, so I, I understand that uh, that this business started uh, operating in, in, in the way, or at least similar to the way it's been operating since Mr. Jen bought it in 1979. I think he bought it in 1994, uh, uh, 1994 if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, um, and uh, just bleeding for a moment into the parking spaces, um, Mr. Jen is uh, from China um, and he's, in the, he's a US citizen. He has an MBA degree from the University of Utah and um, um, came over here as a young man and learned our language and has been, you know, um, successful, you know, uh, by any standards. But I always say that because he kind of caters to um, an Asian clientele. So a lot of his, um, a lot of his residents, the people that come and stay the, uh, at, at the hostel, um, that they're, they're quite frequently Asian and there's quite frequently a van or a small bus full of them. And they're not like each renting a Hertz rental car and parking um, there. And so he'll, he'll usually have, you know, um, a lot of short term residents stay, you know, one to three nights as they're uh, touring through the Western United States. And um, um, if you if you were to go into his um, hostel, you would see that some of the rooms are like a traditional motel where you rent a room and there's one or two beds in there. Um, but the vast majority is it's like a that there might be a room, a large room with like eight different bunk beds in there. So you might have 12 or 15 people sleeping in there at the same time, which in our in our culture is um, abnormal, but um, in the Asian culture, um, it's um, it, it's not. And so that's that's kind of the clientele that that he caters to. And of course, he speaks fluent um, Chinese. Um, so Tom, can I? Yeah. Dr. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, can I just interrupt? Just one, yeah. one question I wanted to ask at the outset uh, sure. a little bit is: uh, Has the use always kind of been the same? I mean, since 1994, yes. has, has, the, has the, the so the use hasn't 
evolved or changed or started one way and kind of a, a turned into more of a hotel motel use or whatever. It's it's always kind of been run and operated as the same use, at least from your client's perspective. Exactly the same. I do know that uh, today um, he has a couple of employees who live there and work there. Um, and I'm not sure uh, um, how long that's been going on. Um, but um, but in terms of his clientele and, and the market and the use, it's it's been the same since at least 1994, and I'm not sure exactly how it was run before he purchased it. But okay, I, I don't Thank think very much more than three percent since 1994. So it's it's the same business, and not that it matters. But you, uh, uh, Mr. Jen, he he's owned this since '94. He he now owns hotels in Washington and Oregon and uh, two or three other states, and he bought a big hotel in. Bismarck, uh, North Dakota last year. And I mean, it, it has hundreds of rooms. And so he's kind of been staying up there kind of trying to get, that's like the biggest hotel he's ever had. So um, uh, I didn't realize this was Zoom until an hour or so ago, but um, he asked me to handle this because he he was assuming that it was in person and, and he's, he's in North Dakota. He also frequently travels to China because uh, he still has family there. But um, <clears throat> he... Uh, Purchased, I think, the 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 hostel from William P. Hales, who originally sought permission from the city to operate a boarding or rooming house back in 1997, uh, 1979. And Mr. Hales's request um, and it was conditioned, it was granted on the condition um, that are referenced in the January 24th notice of violation that we received. Um, and, and the notice that we received says the current zoning certificate for the property list the authorized use as a boarding rooming house limited to 34 occupants with off off street off site parking as provided in BOA case number 8128 um, and that BOA case number dates back to October 22nd of 1979 so the first violation was that the RMF 35 zoning does not allow the property to operate as a hotel slash motel and um uh, I think a primary concern with this allegation is that the property has been repeatedly, the primary concern that my client has is that the property has been repeatedly inspected by the city over the decades, as we've talked about, at least two and a half decades. And well, it's three decades almost since he purchased the property. Um, and despite other violations being raised and addressed, and I, I think for the most part resolved, the overall use of the property has never been an issue since at least 1998. Um, for example, uh, we've listed on page three of our response um, violations in 2009, 2010, 2016, 2019, well, two of them, 2019, three of them, 2020 and 2022. And um, in, in all of those prior violations, um, the, there, there have been inspections and 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 issues uh, resolved, but but the the property is all, was always determined to be compliant. And so I, I think my client scratching his head, saying, you know, what what's different now? And the table that we included is certainly not exhaustive. I did have to file a grandma request or two to get the records that we have, and I understand um, I understand that records disappear and and files get you know I, I understand how that happens, but. I don't think we have all the records and I know we have the burden of proof and I'm not trying to make an excuse, but I just want you to know we've done a, um, a pretty exhaustive search and trying to get all the records we can to give you um, a, a full accounting of this property. But um, um, it, it's based on the records we've seen, it appears to us that the city has always been aware, aware of the property's usage um, throughout that lengthy history and has found like Lynn Pace did um, when he was a city attorney that that the property's compliant. And I don't know, I know Lynn Pace, I know he's, uh, uh, I, I know him from uh, the Capitol, but I don't know if he was the city attorney or the assistant city attorney uh, back in the nineties uh, when when that last case was, the, the other case was closed in exhibit 12. So um, historically um, uh, the, the usage was, um, well, in addition, the usage was directly addressed on September 17th of 1996 a letter from Salt Lake City to um, Elizabeth Heath, and that is uh, included in our appeal as Exhibit 14. Um, and there's a zoning certificate there that also references 
um, the RM35. And um, in that letter, um, I think I've got that exhibit right. But Harvey Boyd, on behalf of the city, states that the property is licensed to operate as a 14-room rooming house. And, um, and he wrote, um, for your information, Salt Lake City defines a rooming house in Chapter 5.56, rooming houses and boarding houses of Salt Lake City Code. This definition is stated as follows. Rooming houses means any place where rooms are rented or kept for rental or lodging or sleeping purposes by the day, week, or month where such rental does not include board uh, by whatever name such place is denominated, such as a hotel, motel, lodging house, or rooming house. I'm sorry, that was exhibit 11 that I was just quoting. And that is a letter from Harvey Boyd um, to uh, Elizabeth Heath at the hostel. I think she was a manager at the time, dated September 17th, 1996. So what it appears to me is the definition of rooming house has changed over the years. And I think that's why um, the, the Lynn Pace notation said that, uh, that this is a, an established non-conforming um, use. So um, there was also a letter in 1998 uh, filed by, uh, followed by the detail request report, um, which further clarified the history. And that report indicates that the city had received complaints about the property's use and advertisement as a hostel a note on the report says, uh, and that's the one I already read to you in Exhibit 12, that it's been determined that there's a non-conforming use. Sorry for repeating myself. While it's clear at some point the definition for rooming house and properties was changed, um, what hasn't changed is the property's use. As of 1998, it was clear that the property had been granted a non-conforming use to operate openly as a hostel. Um, there's nothing in the property's history to indicate that this non-conforming use was ever revoked or otherwise uh, readdressed. And I can tell you, because um, I know you know, if a non-conforming use is abandoned for a year, it's lost. The, 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 there hasn't been a year, even during COVID, um, this this operation remained um, you know, as an ongoing business concern. So there hasn't been like any period where it shut down for, for over a year. Um, the June 1st, 1994 Certificate of License was issued to Wishan Jin and the Avenues Residential Center for Lodging Services in a 14-room house. That's Exhibit 17. And it was issued several years prior to the city's 1998 letter acknowledging that the property was accepted as a non-conforming use, and that's Exhibit 18. Um, this demonstrates that the property's non-conforming use status was in place and widely accepted even after Mr. Jen purchased the property. And um, we don't believe there's any uh, colorable argument or evidence that the non-conforming use ended um, with the sale of the property to Mr. Jen. Um, under uh, Salt Lake Municipal Code 21A-62-040, non-conforming use is defined as any building or land legally occupied by use at the time of passage of the ordinance codified herein or amendment thereto, which does not conform after the passage of said ordinance or amendment thereto with the regulation of the district in which located. The property has continually operated in the same or similar capacity since 1979. Um, it's been operating openly with city permission as a hostel since at least the early 1990s. Um, we believe the city code makes it clear that the fact that the definition for rooming or boarding house changed at some point, but but as a, because it's a non-conforming use, that change should be irrelevant to whether uh, the property complies with the, the current zoning because it's pre-existing use as a hostel it makes it a non-conforming use um, and that... Um, is a legal operation under Salt Lake Code 21A-62-040, which is the non-conforming use sec um, section. So the January 24th notice and order, we believe fails to acknowledge or account for the property's history uh, as a non-conforming use in its operation and the history of the city's involvement with the property. Um, the, uh, there's a, a case that we cited uh, from the Utah Court of Appeals Check it's versus Providence City uh, in 2018. It says the zoning estoppel doctrine it stops a governmental entity from ex exercising its zoning powers to prohibit a proposed land use when the property owner, relying reasonably in good faith on some governmental act or omission, has made a substantial change in position or incurred such extensive obligations or expenses that it would be highly inequitable to deprive the owner of his right to complete the proposed development. Um, as we've discussed, um, the property has been operating its current capacity with city's full knowledge for at least two and a half decades. Before the, the current notice and order that we received in January, um, there has not been a time when the city sought to put an end to the hostile business based on zoning. 
Um, as the 1998 letter makes clear, the city has long recognized uh, the property as a legal non-conforming use, and, and Mr. Jen relied on the city's continuing uh, reissuance of his certificates and his business licenses, and to suddenly move the goalpost now after decades of, of operations would effectively shutter at least the current business model, and um, um, such a move we believe would be in violation of the zoning estoppel doctrine and would be um, in contradiction of the city's prior representations. Um, Okay, I'd like to move now to violation number two, which is the number of required parking spaces. Um, the certificate, um, Mr. Jen's zoning certificate for the property does refer to BOA case number 8128, which dates back to, um, um, I, I believe, 1979. We attached as exhibit um, 14, I'm sorry for that pause, a December 30th, 2003 zoning certificate. And um, it, it, it says zoning certificate, it's 04-005356 issued on December 30th of 2003. It says this certificate has been issued pursuant to an administrative interpretation dated October 7th of 03. This document certifies that the property located at 107 North F Street, that is the property, is zoned RMF 35 and the authorized use as boarding rooming house. And then it says specific conditions associated with this site. Current legal use is a boarding rooming house limited to 34 occupants with off street off site parking as provided per BOA case number 8128, which was dated 10 2279. See legalization, um, legalization file. I'm not sure what C legalization file means but this was a new zoning certificate issued in 2003 so i'll be the first to admit um we don't have um uh, the property has some off street parking um it's it's behind the 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 building and um i don't have that graphic in front of me maybe staff could help i think it's it's maybe six or eight stalls but i i don't know for sure i parked back there myself but i haven't counted that recently um, but I'll, I'll admit we don't have the 24 or 34 or whatever the, the violation says, but um, I, I guess our point is, is um, that wasn't included in the 2003 zoning certificate. Um, it, and, and that certificate just said off street, off site parking, which it does have. Um, there's nothing to indicate that Mr. Jen was provided a copy of the 1978 BOA case number 8128. And, um, and I haven't been able to locate that through my searches and my grandma request. Um, I'm not sure if those records still exist, um, but the property does have the off-street parking. Um, there's also a lot of on-street parking, of course, in those neighborhoods, which you know I'm sure the residents would rather all of that be used for themselves and for their guests rather than uh, visitors to the hostel. But like I said, a lot of these visitors are foreign visitors who are on a bus or, or, or like a maybe a 15 passenger van and um, so they're not like, not all of his guests are renting their cars and parking it there each night. Um, the 1979 condition of a specific number of parking spaces um, hasn't been enforced. And I recognize that doesn't mean you can't enforce it today. I'm not su suggesting that. I'm just saying in the 44 years since 1979, the re it was 18, the requirement that they have 18 spaces, I said 24, 34, but it was 18. It's never been addressed in the other um, the other times the property has been inspected or the violations have been resolved. Um, as of May May of last year, there were reports that um, 107 F North F Street had two additional residential units in violation of city code. The city raised these concerns at the property, and the property responded by addressing those concerns. Um, there were inspections, but there's no um, documentation about parking spaces. So. The notice in civil order, the second one, says the, the, the city records indicate that 18 parking stalls were never constructed. That's true. Uh, therefore, the use as a boarding rooming house was never legally established. I think we take issue with that because it has been used as a boarding and rooming house at least since the early 90s, if not since 1979. Um, and um, so in terms of th that um, issue, we believe that the zoning certificate issued for the property in 2003, which I just discussed, fails to specify a specific number of, of off-street parking spaces that are required. 
um, and stating that the property needs to have off-street, off-site parking uh, as provided in BOA case number 8128, the city appears to be saying only that some amount of off-street, off-site parking is required. And, and like I said, there are some spaces there. Alternatively, the zoning certificate appears to be almost intentionally obscure by stating parking is required, but to know just how much parking is required, you must first locate a set of minutes from 1979 that we haven't been able to locate. Secondly, if the legal use of the property was never established, then it, I can't. I think it begs the question: How has this property, uh, you know, how has this issue never been addressed in 44 years when every year the the city's been issuing a, a business license and he's been paying his fees? The property has been subject of numerous inspections, of, as we've talked about over the decades, and it doesn't appear that the parking issue was ever raised as a problem. This fact alone raises um, the specter of uneven import, enforcement. Uh, the prior owner, William Hales, on whom the parking requirement was first imposed, was apparently never confronted about the issue despite being notified of the required number of spaces. Even after Mr. Jen purchased the property in 94, he wasn't notified of the requirement until I think late last year. Um, and uh, again, it was omitted from the 2003 uh, zoning certificate. So um, in conclusion, um, the January 24th notice and order uh, we believe represents a sudden dramatic uh, change of the city's position uh, with an effort to terminate the longstanding legal business operations. Um, this has been an unexpected challenge uh, to the business after so many years of operation. Um, and uh, in the past, we've always been found compliant with city codes. Um, we have proposed, and the city hasn't taken us up on it, uh, a mediation between the city and ourselves using the property rights on Busman's office. I talked to the that office a couple of months ago and they said that they they would coordinate that. I, I don't know if that's something that would be of interest today, but that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions or at least try to. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Todd, Pre appreciate it. Um, what, one question I have, and it's okay if you can't answer it, and it's not necessarily dispositive, but um, let, let's assume that the 18 parking spaces, um, you know, would be required and or have been, but can they be constructed? Is there even a place? I mean, is it possible to create 18 spaces off, off street, um, you know, based on, you know, at least what I saw from the images that, you know, again, there's six to eight, yeah uh, spaces I, I mean can you even build that many spaces or would it be a multi-level parking garage anyway just a yeah i i doubt that that many could be built um i i'm not an engineer and i haven't we haven't you know had sure. hired anybody to look at that i mean right. i guess it's possible like if they were pulling up you know and parking like with the front bumper against the building i'm sure it's possible to get a few more spaces than what they have but if it's if it's six right now, we'd be talking about three hundred percent increase. If it's eight right now, it'd be over double. So my guess is no. Um, I don't know that that's physically possible without a raised parking structure. I'm not sure how the neighbors would feel about that. But as as you all know, those those parking structures are incredibly uh, you know expensive to build. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it would be possible to get eighteen spaces in there. Thank you very much. Uh, let's let's hear from uh, the city, Catherine. And, and I misspoke because Exhibit Two does appear to be some minutes from 1979. So I didn't I don't it didn't mean to lie. I, I think we did find some of those minutes there. So that's Exhibit Two to our appeal. Great. Thank you for that clarification, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Mr. Berthon. Should I assume that you have seen and, and read the city's brief. I don't yes. want to belabor. Yes, yes um, thank you. I feel like the city has has thoroughly briefed the, the, the issues that are um, before you this evening. Um, so I won't belabor all of those arguments, um, but we'll rely on them. But wanted to kind of note the following things and then and then I'd like to respond more specifically to some of the issues raised by Mr. Weiler. So in his appeal, uh, Mr. Jin makes three arguments against the zoning administrator's decision uh, that the city should be stopped from enforcing the variance conditions. It appears that appellant doesn't dispute that those are 
um, conditions imposed by the Board of Adjustment and that um, the, the property does not comply with those conditions. Uh, the second, that the zoning certificate did not put him on notice of the Board of Adjustments variance conditions and that a hostel is a legal non-conforming use. Um, as all, th all three of appellants um, arguments fail, Zoning estoppel, um, as we've cited in our brief, only applies when a property owner relying reasonably and in good faith on some governmental act or omission has made a substantial change in position or incurred such extensive obligation or expenses that it would be highly inequitable to enforce the city's decision. Exceptional circumstances must exist for an estoppel claim to prevail against a government entity. A proponent of an estoppel claim can only rely on very clear, well substantiated representations by a government entity to oppose subsequent government action contradicting such very clear, well substantiated representations. Appellant cannot meet this high burden. Contrary to appellant's mischaracterization of the record, the Board of Adjustment in 1982 and the Planning Department in 2003 told the applicable property owner that the property could not be used as a hostel. Appellant has not shown, um, furthermore, the appellant has not shown any substantial change in position due to the city's delay in enforcing the variance conditions. As set forth in the city's brief, mere purchase of the property is not enough under Utah law to show substantial change. And we heard no argument um, in appellant's brief that um, any substantial change was made subsequent to purchase of the property. Furthermore, zoning estoppel is not available to appellant because of the city's delay in enforcing the variance conditions. Contrary to appellant's claims, the zoning certificate and the contemporaneous letter issued to appellant's counsel put appellant on notice of the variance conditions. Appellant's zoning certificate directed the appellant to review the Board of Adjustment records, um, which are attached as, as exhibits both to the appellant's brief and to the city's brief. Um, and the appellant, appellant's failure to do so, um, while unfortunate, certainly does not rise to the level of exceptional circumstances that should prevent the city from enforcing those conditions now. Um, appellant it freely acknowledges in its brief that the that the prior property owner from which he purchased the property was aware of those variance conditions, um, so it should not have been a surprise. Despite appellant being inform informed in both 1982 and 2003 that the property could not be used as a hostel, appellant nevertheless claims that the use is legally non-conforming. As outlined in the city's brief, this argument fails because the appellant has not provided, has not applied for a legal non-conforming use determination. It's just a, we've got a procedural problem here. That determination has not occurred. Um, and the appellant has provided no evidence that a hostel was ever a legal use in the applicable zoning district. Rather, the record reflects that a hostel wasn't a legal use when um, the property started being used as a hostel, which is why the Board of Adjustment said in 1982, no, a hostel is not a, a permitted use in this zone. You cannot operate it as that. You can only use it as a boarding house in conformance with the variance conditions. So instead of, so we have no evidence that a hostel was ever a permitted use in the zoning district. Um, the records instead show that the property was only able to become a boarding house subject to the terms of the 1979 variants. As the city has never affirmatively waived those conditions, they remain applicable. Based on the city's records and appellant's representations regarding the existing condition and use of the property, those conditions were never complied with and therefore the boarding rooming house use was not legally established. In order to provide adequate parking for and curtail the transient nature of the occupants of the property, which is located in a residential area, the variance conditions must be complied with. As appellant has declined to do so, the zoning administrator properly revoked the zoning certificate. 
So I'd like to address a, a number of things um, that Mr. Weiler um, addressed. We've done so in our brief, but I'd like to highlight a few of them. The property, um, so, so much is made of this Exhibit 12, um, which is a internal case log note from 1998. There is a few issues in any claim by appellant that this case log note is useful for any purpose. First, there's no indication that this case log note was communicated to the appellant. Without a representation, it's not clear to the city how um, Mr. Jin could rely on this document. Second, it's not a, the city considers this document not a clear and, pardon me, it's not a clear and well substantiated representation that the property is um, no longer subject to the Board of Adjustment Variance conditions. Those conditions aren't mentioned at all. It's not clear at all from the creators of that note whether they were even aware of those conditions. So we believe that that document can't be used as some sort of um, waiver of those conditions. Yes, that internal case log note um, identifies the property as a non-conforming use for a rooming house. We don't dispute that the property is a non-conforming use. We dispute that it is a legal non-conforming use. The Board of Adjustment decision makes clear that the property could not be used in the way proposed by the property owner at that time without the variance. So absent the absent the variance and compliance with the terms of that variance, the, the property was never legally established as a boarding house. And certainly under the 1982 um, appeal of the zoning interpretation, it was never, um, it never received a variance and the decision was upheld that the zoning code did not permit a hostel to be operated in the zone. Much is made about the business licenses issued to the property. Um, as we know, under uh, Utah case law and Ben Hamey, a business license cannot waive zoning requirements. And those ministerial acts cannot be attributed as a, as a clear, well-substantiated representation of, as a waiver of those requirements that were um, made to the property owner by the Board of Adjustment, both in 1979 and in 1982. The city is somewhat perplexed by the appellant's claim that the city was required to designate on the zoning certificate that specifically 18 parking spaces were required. We don't believe that there's any support for that in Utah law. We think the zoning certificate um, is clear in that the terms of the Board of Adjustment case were incorporated into the terms of that zoning certificate. We don't believe that there has been any um, separation in the city's decision making on this property in terms of whether the property was ever allowed to be a non-conforming use not subject to those variance conditions. We haven't seen any evidence provided by appellant where those conditions were affirmatively waived. There's just been a consistent decision that is consistent with the Board of Adjustment decision that the property was um, a legal boarding and rooming house. The documents provided by appellant just simply don't address the variance conditions. And so we don't believe there's been an affirmative waiver by the city of those conditions. Because zoning estoppel requires a, a representation by the city that those conditions no longer applied and the mere passage of time um, is not enough to um, have an equitable doctrine like estoppel apply against the city. 
Um, we respectfully request that the decision of the zoning administrator be affirmed. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'll give uh, the appellant, uh, I'll give you a chance to any final uh, words or rebuttal, um, uh, if, if any. Yeah, if, uh, very briefly, I just uh, would direct your attention to Exhibit 2, which is the minutes from October 22nd, 1979 meeting of, uh, um, I'm not sure which which uh, board it was, but at the, at the time, the owner, William Hales, um, and uh, Virginia Hales, may, maybe his wife, they explained that they were Purchasing the property, which which we're discussing, it, it had been a nursing home uh, with 51 occupants, and um, um, and he had proposed uh, actually tearing down the house next door um, to um, to include a total of 18 stalls, and the neighborhood and and the city uh, ultimately decided, you know, that they didn't want that house torn down. And um, I just want to read the uh, second paragraph on, on the top of page two of Exhibit 2. It says, Mr. Collister, one of the board members at the time, moved that the variance to remodel the existing nursing home into a boarding house without the required parking and the special exception to the ordinance to permit the portion of the parking in a residential district be granted, provided the boarding house is limited to 34 occupants, and the management is responsible to see that the tenants park off the street, utilizing the various off-street parking stalls outlined in, uh, by the petitioner, which was the, the parking that, as I read it, that's, that's still available on the off-site. Also that the stalls become required open space for the boarding house and cannot be eliminated or used for other purposes unless the number of boarders or rumors are, re uh, rumors are reduced. And so while, while everybody keeps on pointing to this case number 8128 from 1979, um, as I read this as, as what we've attached to exhibit two, this did permit a variance so they didn't have to have um, 18, uh, well, I, I don't see how this variance is requiring 18, parking stalls um, because they didn't want them to burn uh, to 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 to, to uh, destroy the the neighboring property so if I'm reading that wrong that's fine but I'm I'm reading that a variance was granted for less parking than would have been required and and it seemed to me that the vote was um, where the nursing uh, facility uh, had 51 occupants that they were limiting this to 34 occupants um, and um, and asking the management to to see that the tenants park off the street whenever possible. There is a note in there that they um, that they were renting primarily to for, uh, foreign students, and a lot of them didn't have cars. And so, in any event, um, that's 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 my only rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I I appreciate the the hard work of of city and appellant on on this issue and, and particularly digging up the uh, documents that were uh at least as old or older than i am and uh but this this is this is very helpful i i am going to take the matter under advisement and will issue uh my my decision um taking in everything i've heard today i'm sorry matt can i put you on pause for just a minute this is a, yeah. a public hearing and we oh, thank have you. one attendee in. in, Th in uh, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, so I will hold off. And uh, for those in the public that are wishing to speak, um, I, that will be absolutely welcome. Thank you. We have one person with their hand up. Mary, you have been allowed to be unmuted. You'll need to unmute yourself. Hey. Oh, uh, hello. I bought this, my house at 127 F Street uh, in 1975. And it was a nursing home then. And it was, I believe, Virginia Peebles that bought it from uh, Bertie 
O'Hara. And, uh, oh, I don't know. We would like to point out some factual things that are not, were not included by the attorney. Uh, the hostel has been used for people out of jail and out of prison. And how can you find that? Um, in the Salt Lake Tribune, and it's archived in, if you just Google the Avenues Hostel, posted July 20th, 2009, uh, the owner of the hostel tells the Salt Lake Tribune uh, that he has good people who stays there while he acknowledges some of his visitors are fresh out of jail or prison, he says he's not going to turn them away with his international business down right now. And last year, KUTV, this is also, if you Google the Avenues Hostel, he told the, them at that time that he the hostel does not discriminate against anybody who needs a place to stay. And uh, anyway, it's caused various problems in the neighborhood, as you can imagine. Um, do you have anything? Yes. To say? Hi, my name is Ann Alba, and I am also a neighbor of the hostel for 17 years. And the first thing I'd like to say is that we have been trying to get the police department to give us the numbers of calls from, from the police department, the fire department, and the, um, and the, uh, um, the medical people to come and try and save people that have overdosed there. And we cannot seem to get that information, but we do have we do have from one year in 2008 till July of 2009, that's 18 months, there were 150 police calls to this address, 150. That means that that is 27.7% of the total days that the police were there. We have had so many problems and it is ongoing. It doesn't get any better. And we've got to do something about that, number one. And also the parking. I have called the, uh, the um, uh, city parking enforcement on numerous occasions to get them to ticket cars that are out in the street that are all parked illegally, they're in front of driveways and they're cars from the hostel and they park all over all they want to. And we had one guy over there, his car was parked kind of across the driveway, across the street. And he had it up on blocks while he worked on it for weeks. I don't know how this goes on, but it certainly does. I personally called the health department to come and do a cleanup over there. They had about a dozen old refrigerators that were all in between the two places and none of them worked. They were all sitting there and they were, I don't know, they're just there. They had an old hot tub with all kinds of trash piled under it. I mean, it's sometimes it is just a total garbage dump. So, Let's see, oh, I am a long way from through. There's, they, uh, it is just, it, it, it's ongoing. And it's really, really unfortunate. We have a lovely neighborhood. And I think that it would be a good idea if somebody really had to look at what happens here on a day-to-day -day basis. The worst thing probably is, is the people that are in and out of there. My neighbor right next door here, actually Mary's neighbor right next door, three people had been evicted from the hostel, which I can't believe that anyone has ever evicted but they, they put them out and then they tried to break into her house. They tried to break into her back door. So, I mean, we haven't heard anything about that. And these people, we've had long-term people, a man named Sigmund, who was actually German and he lived there for at least three years until he died. I mean, and I had no problem with Sigmund, but there's the, that's the point is sometimes you have people there that are really long-term and sometimes you just have people right out of prison that are there for a day or two. There's a lot of drug dealing that goes on. All this stuff really, really needs to be addressed. And so we'd like you to do that. I think it's a good idea if they had 18 parking spaces, but they have eight. I counted them this morning. 
Okay, go on, Mary. Uh, yes, if you could be, if you could uh, get the information from. I'm sorry, it, whoever's speaking, could if you're oh, different than I'm the last sorry. person, could you please identify it's, yourself it's, for the record? Mary Mahler again. Okay. At 127 or 125, excuse me, I'm nervous. 121 F Street. Uh, could if you could at least get the information from the police, Detective Maria. It's Marie. Um, let me find her phone number here. It is Marie Stewart. 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 Yes, she's Detective Marie Stewart. I have called her twice this week and once last week to ask her to please give us the number of calls, the number of calls for the police department, even if we can't get all the calls, at least for the police department. Mm -hmm. I think that the hostel basically is a nuisance and it should be treated as such. Thank okay. you for your comments, yes. lady. I'm going to go ahead and mute you now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your input. Do we have any anyone else? Is, is that all of the public hearing that we have? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. We appreciate uh, th that that input. Um, uh, Ms. Mr. Wheeler, I'm assuming you don't feel like you need to respond, but uh, certainly give you an opportunity if, if, if you would like to, and or Ms. Fasker as well, uh, to the public hearing itself before. Yeah, we just just very up. quickly, I, I understand, um, I understand the neighborhood complaints. And as I mentioned, that there have been a series of complaints over the past several decades. I'm not sure that, um, although that testimony is, um, I, I think, well-intentioned and passionate and and I believe that they're, you know, giving the input that they feel like you should know. I, I don't know that it directly relates to um, either of the the violations um, that the hostel was uh, cited for. I, I do believe that during COVID, um, that there there was maybe, um, you know, some um, some of the people on uh, that that they described that were living there because tourism, you know, ground to a halt. But that that hasn't generally been the practice. Uh, before or after COVID, but again, I'm not sure that that's relevant to the non-conforming use status and 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 whatnot. So, thank you for the opportunity to respond. Thank you, Ms. Pasker. I assume any, anything from you. Yes, thank you. the The comments by the community members reflect um, the tenor of the complaints that the city has received regarding this property, um, which is. While the city has investigated the property in the past, it has never cited um, the property for the, the lack of the parking stalls or the um, short-term occupancy issues. It, it's because of the more recent um, complaints by the community um, of the type that you've heard this evening that led the city to um, getting more of the departments together, putting their heads together on what could be done to address the, the public health and welfare issues posed by this property, um, which led to um, the planning department looking in its records and, and discovering these um, documents from the Board of Adjustment from the late 1970s and early 1980s. Um, so that is what has precipitated the city's investigation and the discovery of these issues. Um, and why they haven't been brought up before. But as um, I'm sure you can appreciate, Mr. Wortham, these, these complaints are not the city's basis for revoking the zoning certificate, but we believe that by revoking it and requiring the property to come into compliance with any of the permitted uses in the RMF 35 zone, that some of these issues um, are likely to be addressed. Thank you very much. Okay, as as I mentioned before, I'll uh, be taking this matter under advisement. We'll issue uh, my written decision again. Thank you uh, all for your input and uh, um, and time on this matter, and that will conclude our appeals hearing this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Have a good one. You too. Thanks, everyone.